Once again, I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar, Using Electronic Consent and Technology to Facilitate and Improve the Research Process, Regulatory and IRB Considerations. I'm Ari Burgess, Quorum's Director of Client Relations. We here at Quorum are very excited to be discussing this topic with you today. This is our second webinar, and they've been really well received, so we're planning several additional topics for 2012. On that note, there will be a few survey questions at the end of this, um, at the end of this webinar where we're going to ask you what topics are of interest to you. This is in an effort to continue to offer webinars on topics that are current and interesting, so please do take a few minutes to complete the survey. I'll be giving you a brief overview of Quorum before introducing our presenter, but first off, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. So question and answers. Um, Feel free to submit questions at any point during the webinar using the chat box on the webinar dashboard. If time allows, we'll answer a few questions at the end of the webinar. The remaining questions and answers will be posted on our website. We'll be emailing you a link to view additional questions and answers as soon as it's available. And additionally, there will be a recording and a slide deck distribution, so the webinar recording and slide deck will be posted on our website, and we'll be sending out links to the, to the recording as well. Feel free to share these links with your staff and or your colleagues. Quorum Review is a fully accredited IRB. We have been around for nearly 20 years. We are accredited through 2014. We're fully compliant with FDA and OHARP requirements. We are international. Boards are available for review of both U.S. and Canadian studies. We have a very strong framework of employees. We have over 180 employees. We're one of the largest IRBs in the United States. And over 60% of our IRB members, 40% of our staff, and 20% of our study managers and study support positions are certified IRB professionals. We have eight board meetings each week. We have turnaround times that include 24-hour site turnarounds, 36-hour amendment turnarounds, and same-day site changes. We have one-time CD and audit documentation submission. And then we have site support and customer support that is available from 8 a.m. Eastern Time to 8 p.m. Eastern Time. We also have a dedicated study management task staff. At Quorum, we believe that there is a very big need for electronic communication, so we have a secure portal which offers smart forms, status reports, and approval documents all online. We have a customized phase one and post-marketing process, and then we're also spearheading an effort to work more closely with academic medical centers, hospitals, and universities. And we offer a flexible, customized process for these institutions. We know that quality is important to all of our customers, so we have 100% quality control on all documents. Now I'm going to go ahead and introduce our presenter, Mitchell Parrish. Mitchell joined Quorum in January of 2010 as an attorney in our regulatory department. Prior to Quorum, Mr. Parrish worked as a regulatory counsel for Western IRB and as a regulatory advisor to the National Cancer Institute Central IRB. Mr. Parrish earned his Juris Doctor from the University of Oregon School of Law and is a member of Washington State Bar, including the Health and Corporate Law sections. Additionally, Mr. Parrish is a member of the American Bar Association and is a certified institutional review board professional. Mitchell? So, thank you for the introduction, Ari, and to everyone attending the webinar today, good morning, and if you're on the East Coast, good afternoon. So, again, my name is Mitchell Parrish, and today I'm going to be talking about using electronic consent and technologies and research, regulatory and IRB considerations. Now, how I've uh, laid out this presentation before us today is in the five different sections. First, I'm going to talk about the webinar overview, and here I'm just going to briefly discuss why it's even important that we're having this discussion about electronic technologies today. Then the next four sections, the main sections, are broken into electronic consent, electronic technologies to help facilitate consent, electronic data storage, electronic data monitoring. Now, within each of these last four sections, I'm going to start off by first providing brief examples so we're all on the same page when we know we're what we're talking about with these various technologies. Next, I provide some benefits and some challenges to implementing these technologies. And finally, I wrap up each section with a discussion of the applicable regulations as well as IRB considerations. So first, the webinar overview. Why do we even need to discuss this topic today? 
Well, first, electronic technologies are being viewed as an increasingly popular and effective tool in all aspects of human subject research. Additionally, technology is not going away. Here at Quorum, we've seen a trend in the increased use of electronic technologies, and we know this is only going to continue to increase. So it's very important that we understand how to use these technologies, how to apply the appropriate regulations, and how to work with the IRB when using these technologies. Additionally, the FDA and OHARP have not produced much guidance on the use of electronic technologies. Now, I say much guidance. There is some guidance, for example, OHARP does have an FAQ on the use of electronic signatures. However, the guidance put forth and the regulations are not specifically applicable to the various technologies that are out there today and do not provide much guidance to the IRB, to institutions, to CROs, sponsors, investigators, study coordinators on how to actually use these technologies and how to comply with the regulations when using these technologies. Now, even if the FDA or OHARP um, manages to really produce a guidance or regulations that are very applicable and very informative and help answer all sorts of questions relating to these various electronic technologies, there's always going to be innovation and there's always going to be technologies that are evolving. So therefore, no matter even if guidance comes out tomorrow or any year, the evolution of these technologies is going to always have questions unanswered and scenarios unaddressed. So it's really important that we have these discussions amongst leaders in the industry to make sure we're all on the same page and understand what the applicable regulations are and understand how to really work with each other when we're using these electronic technologies since we don't have a lot of guidance from the federal agencies. Now I want to move into our first main section today. For the next few moments I'm going to be talking about electronic consent. Again, starting off with examples. So here, so we're all on the same page, I want to provide some examples of when electronic consent may be appropriate. The first example I list is online survey studies. So here specifically, I say patients are asked their activity and pain level three months after receiving composite femoral components for hip arthroplasty. So here, patients are asked questions about this online. All the information is online, so it really doesn't make sense to have a subject have to go in for a visit and consent when all their questions, all the data is being stored online. It makes the most sense to have electronic consent. The next, the next example is screening. So here, oftentimes, subjects, when they're entering to a drug study or device study, they may have to come into an in-person visit to have a screening visit. Well, you don't necessarily have to have this in-person visit. You can have screen questions that are online, and when subjects answer these questions, they can provide their consent online as well, saving a trip to the actual site. So for screening, it may make sense to have electronic consent to kind of alleviate that first visit that's unnecessary. The next example is submitting biological specimens via mail or FedEx. So here a specific example is a company conducting genetics research is collecting buccal samples for analysis. Since subjects are just kind of taking a swab and they may be taking just a sample of the inside of their cheek, putting it in the mail, and submitting that to a, a central database or, or bank, it doesn't make a lot of sense to have to have an in-person consent process. So here a lot of the information can be filled out online, the sample is sent via mail, electronic consent may make the most sense in this instance. Next example is previously collected tissue research. So here, let's say cosmetic surgery patients are contacted for their consent to use their discarded tissue to test a new topical drug for hair growth. The subjects went in for cosmetic surgery as standard of care. Tissue was taken. They're then later contacted regarding their discarded tissue. You don't necessarily need that subject to come back in to provide their consent. It can be done electronically. And finally, the uh, the fifth and last example is in-person paperless survey research. This example is different from all the other ones because here you may actually be in person at a site. But what I'm talking about here is, let's say you have patients with pancreatic cancer and they come into an outpatient oncology infusion site and they're provided with an iPad or some sort of other tablet where they answer questions actually right into that device. And also the consent form may be right on that device. So it doesn't make sense then to have to print out paper and have a signature on paper when you have the device right there. And that's where all the information is being stored. So persons can provide their full signature, but do it in an electronic manner. Now I want to get into the benefits of electronic consent. First, I'm going to talk about the benefits to participants. Well, first, you have the obvious one of convenience. So subjects, uh, it's not always necessary to have to commute to the research site, and this can definitely be a burden to various subjects that have to drive a long distance, and also the money it takes to do that. There may be less pressure. 
participants can review a consent form if it's electronic and if they just have to sign electronically and not have the pressure of where you would come in for a visit and right then you're asked by a study coordinator or the doctor if you want to participate and you're handed a consent form. So here when you do an electronic consent you really have the ability to have your decide whether to participate on your own time. And along these same lines, this may help subjects become more informed. So subjects can take time actually reading through the consent form and really understanding whether or not they want to participate without that pressure of having to be in person with people around asking if they want to participate. There's benefits for researchers as well. And when I use the term researchers, I'm really trying to grab everyone that's involved in the research. So this can be sponsors, CROs, institutions, investigators, study coordinators. So the first potential benefit is higher enrollment. Now I do put a question mark. There's not a lot of data yet. There are some studies being conducted on the use of various technologies and electronic consent to try to help with higher enrollment, but it's not necessarily known at this point. Nonetheless, it seems like if subjects don't have to commute, or if there's less pressure, or if they can take more time to understand if they want to be in the study, it could lead to higher enrollment. Additionally, like you had convenience for participants, you also have convenience for researchers. You can eliminate in-person appointment scheduling visits, for example, and this saves people time that are actually conducting research at the site. Also, again, there's no travel reimbursement. If you're not having people come in, you don't have to pay commuting or parking costs. That is something that you are going to cover. Also, for researchers, having electronic consent and electronic documents means you can go paperless and have the ability to manage documents electronically, which can really increase your capability when conducting research. And what I mean by this, and one really important thing that electronic consent can help, is it can really open the doors to conducting new types of research. So large online studies where you're grabbing people from all over the country, you need to have that ability to do electronic consent, or it may not be feasible if you actually have people come into a site and sign a consent form or even have to mail in a consent form. Of course, there are also challenges to using electronic consent. So for participants, you really may miss out on a consent discussion. Of course, if you're doing electronic consent, you can always use the phone and have your questions answered by an investigator study coordinator, but not being in person, really have the back and forth uh, of an in-person visit may may help a subject not have all their questions answered, for example, so that could be a potential challenge. Also, confidentiality. If you're signing a document, it's now online, not just in the file room. More people may have access to that document, may know you're participating in the research, so there could be some confidentiality concerns. And for researchers, there's challenges as well. First, it can be expensive. There's definitely going to be a high initial expense for infrastructure and technology to manage online documents and to really establish a system that can validate these electronic signatures. Also, there's a concern with verification. How do you actually know that the electronic consent is legitimate and from the participant? And then you also have compliance concerns. So is the electronic consent going to be acceptable to auditors? And also, 21 CFR Part 11, the FDA's regulation on electronic signatures and electronic records of clinical trials may come into effect, and that causes more things you have to comply with. So if you take time to really consider whether or not the research you want to conduct could benefit from having electronic consent, and the challenges really don't outweigh those benefits, then consider using this electronic consent. And if you want to use this electronic consent, how do you actually go about doing that? So now I'm going to talk about the two types of electronic consent and how you'd actually implement where you want to use electronic consent. So the first type I'm going to discuss, and again, this is my term terminology that I've used to distinguish these two types, is a full signature. So this would be an electronic or digital signature treated as though the signature were handwritten on paper. So it's really just like someone's signing a paper copy, except for it's being done electronically. So it's their full signature. The example I always like to use is when you're buying groceries at the grocery store, you have the credit card scanner, you swipe your credit card, and then you pick up that pen, and you sign your name right there electronically on the pad. So this would be an example. Someone is signing their name just like they would on a piece of paper. It's their legally valid signature. Now the issue with full signature is usually this isn't an option of research, especially if you have a large study that's online all over the states. You're going to have to have various software implemented to verify secure signatures to make sure that a full signature really is um, the legally valid signature in that jurisdiction of the person who's signing their name. Nonetheless, it is still an option. And OHARP states specifically that it does accept these electronic signatures. 
But what OHARP also states is that a signature must be legally valid within the jurisdiction where the research is conducted. So if you are having people sign electronically, you would have to know uh, where they're signing and whether or not that type of signature, whether it's uh, a series of symbols or an actual signature written on a tablet, is valid. If you would like more information specifically about what OHARP states, you can see the OHARP informed consent FAQs does provide some helpful information, although it doesn't go in too depthly. What that FAQ also says is it addresses the IRB's role with electronic signatures. So here, not OHARP says that it'll accept electronic signatures. It also says that IRBs may accept electronic signatures. But in order for an IRB to accept electronic signature, the IRB has to know these three things how the electronic signature is being created, if the signature can be shown to be legitimate, and if the consent document can be produced in hard copy for review by the potential participant. So if you do intend to use this full signature electronically, make sure you provide the IRB enough information so the IRB can know how the site of the sponsors actually address this issue of having electronic consent. And if you want a specific example that's out there which uh, would be a viable option for using electronic consent, a full signature, Check out companies like RSA, Entrust, VeriSign, GeoTrust, and ActiveCard. All of these companies provide software that utilizes encryption technology and public key infrastructure. And these are the types of things you would need in place in order to have a valid electronic full signature. Now I'm going to talk about the second type of electronic consent. And this is, I want to distinguish this from the full signature where you're actually going to be signing your name just like you would be on a piece of paper. So the examples I have for this is, you can be doing an online survey study, and you would click on a box that says, by clicking on this box, I agree to, I consent to be in the study, or I agree to be in this study. Another example is, and I've seen this, is by submitting the survey, you are consenting to participate in the research. So these two things, they're not a full signature. Someone's not actually providing their valid signature indicating their consent. But they are doing, taking some sort of action that if you couple that, with a waiver of documentation of consent, this may be legitimate under the regulations and acceptable to the IRB. So we know per the regulations that there has to be documentation of consent. If you don't have that documentation because of that checkbox example, then you must have a waiver of documentation of consent. Now, waiver of documentation of consent is available under the DHHS regulations and also the FDA regulations. So where the FDA regulations do not apply, and just the DHHS regulations may apply, you have two sets of criteria in which you could apply for a waiver of documentation of consent. The elements for the first criteria are, one, the only record linking the subject and the research is the consent document, and two, the principal risk of the research is the potential harm from a breach of confidentiality. And the second criteria is, the research presents no more than minimal risk of harm to subjects, and two, involves no procedures for which written consent is normally required outside of the research context. Now remember the second uh, criteria, because this is the exact same criteria that the FDA puts forth. So the FDA doesn't have that first criteria that the DHHS does, but it does have the second one. So again, if the research presents no more than minimal risk and involves no procedures for which written consent is normally required outside of the research context, you may qualify for a waiver of documentation of consent. To illustrate this regulation, consider a study, it's an, let's say it's an online survey study. And here, an online survey study, let's say someone's taken a dietary supplement and has a weight loss program and they're being asked questions about this, just generally how they feel or um, if they've lost any weight, things of that nature. Now, typically, people may consider this uh, no more than minimal risk, so it would meet that first criteria. Also, people get asked questions in a survey format all the time, whether on the street, online, over the phone. And this typically does not require a signature. So if you're doing it for research purposes, it wouldn't require a signature as well because it doesn't outside of the research context. There's some important things to remember, though, if you have a waiver of documentation of consent. So if someone's clicking a box saying, I agree to be in the study, and you have a waiver of documentation of consent, that's great. But remember, online, you would still need consent from the subject. And what this means, you have to still have that online consent form, or if you have a waiver of documentation of consent, what that online consent form is typically called is an information sheet. Subjects have to be able to read information about the study. And these online consent forms, or information sheet, 
have to have all the elements that a typical consent form would have. These elements are put forth by 45 CFR 46116 under the Department of Health and Human Services regulations and 21 CFR 5025 under the FDA regulations. Now there are a lot of elements that have to be in a consent form and when you're really talking about survey research or online research, you want to make sure those documents are brief. I know that's always people's concern when quorum works with people conducting this type of research. So when you're making that information sheet or online consent form, really consider what elements you do not have to include or that are not required. For example, if the research is minimal risk, you do not have to include compensation for injury language. Also, you may not have to include the number of participants participating in the study. And if it doesn't make sense to tell people how they may be terminated by the PI if they don't follow some sort of procedure, which just doesn't apply if you're filling out questions online, then don't include that type of information that can be required by the regulations. Also, to keep your online document short, consider whether HIPAA authorization language is necessary. Now, online, if you add HIPAA authorization language, this adds a lot of language because HIPAA authorizations have specific requirements. So if you're not a covered entity, or if you're not collecting protected health information, you don't need a HIPAA authorization embedded in your consent form or your information sheet. So consider not including HIPAA language. So that's the end of the first section. And what I want to leave you with are the key takeaways. So first, electronic consent is only appropriate for some types of research. So really consider the type of research you're conducting and whether electronic consent may be beneficial. And do that by considering the benefits and challenges of implementing electronic consent. If you decide you want to use electronic consent, make sure you're compliant with the regulations based on the type of electronic consent obtained. So again, those two types are a full signature, just like someone writing out their handwritten, legally valid signature on a piece of paper, or the second type, an indication of consent, where someone checks the box saying, I agree to be, I agree to be in the study, and where there's also a waiver of documentation of consent. Now, moving on to electronic technologies to help facilitate consent. Again, I want to start off examples so we're all on the same page and know what we're talking about. We're talking about these new technologies to help facilitate consent. So the first example I want to touch on is a podcast. So here, this would be a principal investigator, for example, recording herself explaining the study on a digital player for playback to potential participants. Now, participants are going to have a consent form in front of them that they can read and to help them understand the research, but not everyone is uh, someone who learns simply from reading something. You may be someone who's an auditory learner. So here you can have the investigator or study coordinator actually talking about the study, talking about information in the consent form that people can listen to in addition to reading the consent form. Also, I've seen this in Word documents. So people will have a consent form, they can read it online, and when they get to a certain section, there's an icon at the end of the section that someone can click on. And when they click on it, they'll hear the voice of the investigator or study coordinator that is trying to add supplement information or really explain what that portion of the consent form is talking about. Another example, and these are the examples I think more people think of when you're talking about electronic technologies to help facilitate consent. So the big one's videos. Um, in addition here to a written consent form, there could be a video explaining the study with diagrams, charts, and also people acting out various procedures. This can be extremely helpful to some people, again, who are not simply uh, those persons who learn from reading, but maybe auditory or tactile learners. Also, there can be interactive websites. Here, subjects can seem real engaged during the consent process by not only reading the consent form online, but they can also can click on multimedia, they can click and watch a video, they can see charts, they can listen to people speak. This really helps supplement the informed consent process and helps subjects really understand what they're getting into before they make their informed consent decision. Now, there are going to be benefits to using some of these technologies. Now, first, the benefits for participants. I say true informed consent. So not every person learns the same. We have auditory, visual, and tactile learners. And supplementing consent forms and consent discussions with videos or with interactive websites may really help get that information across to people so they really can understand and have that autonomy to make their own decision by having that true informed consent. So it may help with true informed consent which is beneficial and necessary for participants. There can be less anxiety. A participant who better understands the research may have less anxiety over their participation, and they could be more engaged. A participant engaged in the consent process is more likely an engaged participant in the research, which can benefit not only the participants, but also researchers. Now the benefits for researchers. Again, I use the same benefit here, true informed consent. 
but a little bit different. So obviously you want participants to have true informed consent because they need to have their autonomy to make their own decision. They can only have that through true informed consent. But if you're obtaining that informed consent from subjects, as a researcher, you're more compliant and you're also more ethical with the regulations. Again, if someone's engaged, they may be more likely to participate in the research. This leads to higher enrollment. Again, I have a question mark, but if you have people that understand the research and want to be engaged, want to participate more based on the other technologies to use instead of just reading a, a plain old consent form, then they may be likely to enroll. Also, it's still not widely used to have these various videos or interactive websites to supplement the consent process. So if you're using these things to really help improve the human subject protection industry, then this may kind of put you in a, in a spot as an industry leader and really help the industry move forward. Now there's going to be challenges as well. I don't think there's too many challenges to participants if there's going to be these additional technologies to help facilitate consent. Of course, the technology can always be ineffective, in which case it would just be an additional time waste for participants. Now for researchers, you do have that same challenge where it could be ineffective, so you've spent this money, but it actually didn't end up helping improve the consent process. And again, I mentioned money, it could be expensive. Obviously, anytime you add additional technologies, additional time to help facilitate the consent process, this could make the research more expensive. So if you consider the type of research and whether or not it may be appropriate to have electronic technologies to facilitate consent, and the benefits really outweigh the challenges, then consider implementing those technologies. So how do you go about actually implementing them and complying with the regulations? So first, what the FDA and DHHS regulations require is that the IRB review all research activities, including those relating to informed consent. What this means is whenever you're using these electronic technologies, they're going to be part of the consent process, they're going to be part of the research, they are going to require review. Now, also applicable in addition to the regulations is the FDA's information sheet, a guide to informed consent. And I included an entire quotation from that document. I don't typically like to do this, but here I really like the language from this section. And I like it because it, it makes clear that consent is not just a signature, it's a meaningful exchange of information. And I also really like this quote because it says that the IRB, the sponsor and investigator, all share the responsibility of ensuring the consent process is adequate and that subjects are informed. What this means to me is that if there are these additional electronic technologies to help facilitate consent, this could be a great additional consideration for everyone to work with that shows that subjects may be able to have a more meaningful exchange and be more informed in deciding whether or not to participate in the study. So I stated that these various technologies that you may use are going to require IRB review. Nonetheless, there may be a few scenarios where something wouldn't require review, and I'm going to get into that with a case study on the next slide. But also what I want to make a note of is if there's ever a question about what to submit or whether an electronic technology actually requires review or how to submit that document, work with the IRB. The IRB is a resource. For example, if you're going to be recording a podcast or if you're filming a video, talk to the IRB beforehand or submit a script of the language that's actually going to be used in those technologies. This way, if the IRB has any concerns or wants any changes to that script, that can be made prior to filming or prior to recording. This way you don't have to do it. An additional recording or additional filming, which just means more time and more money. The IRB is there as a resource. So a case study to try to help us really think when there might be instance where you're using an electronic technology to help facilitate consent, but something may not require review. So here I say, an outpatient oncology clinical trial site has a consent form approved for a phase two trial testing the safety and efficacy of a drug to treat pancreatic cancer. Along with the consent form, the site also received IRB approval for its interactive website to facilitate consent. The website contains, as an example, graphs, charts, videos of how to complete subject diaries, and recordings of research coordinators explaining precautions for participants while suffering from a weakened immune system. So my first question, if the site updates its website to include photo images of the approved consent form, does the addition of the images require review? Here you have an approved website, you have an approved consent form. You're simply taking an image, what's approved, nothing's being changed, and you're putting it on the website. Does this require review? Here, it depends on the IRB, but I would likely say no. Again, you have the approved document, nothing's being modified on the approved website. To add a little twist to that, if the site updates its website to include language taken directly from the approved consent form, 
does the addition of this language require IRB review? So here you have the same scenario as first. You have the approved website. You have the approved consent form. But you're not just taking an image of the consent document. You're just taking language from the consent document and putting it on the website. Does this require review? Again, it depends on the IRB, but I may say no in this instance. You have approved language. Nothing is being modified, and now it's just being put on an approved website. Now, finally, the third question. If the site updates its website to include language taken directly from the approved consent form, but modified to have the benefits section highlighted and underlined, does the addition of this language require IRB review? Approved website, approved consent form, but now you're taking language that is approved, but you're highlighting it, you're underlining it. This is changing the meaning or it's emphasizing something that wasn't emphasized before. This changes the content, this would require IRB review. So the key takeaways from the electronic technologies to help facilitate consent section. Now, these new technologies may only be appropriate in some instances, so really consider whether or not you should use it, whether or not it would be appropriate, and consider the benefits and challenges of implementing the technologies. And if you have any questions about what to submit or how to submit, work with the IRB beforehand. The IRB is there as a resource, can help you determine how to put together those materials and how best to submit for review. Moving into the third section, electronic data storage. Here, I want to start off with examples. So the first one I say is studies conducted entirely with electronic data storage. So as a specific example, you have online survey studies conducted throughout the United States. Here it's going to make sense to have electronic data storage because all your data in the first place is electronic, so there's no need to have it in paper format. It just makes sense. Studies conducted partially with electronic data storage. Here's a specific example. You may have a phase four registry study where charts are retrospectively reviewed and data is uploaded into an electronic database. So here, all your study records are gonna be electronic, but you are pulling from source documents that may be on paper. It's gonna make sense to have this electronic data storage. Next, studies conducted with paper and electronic data storage. So here, as a specific example, you may have a phase three clinical trial at sites where the site uploads all trial data recorded on paper into an electronic database. Here, um, for one reason or another, whether or not there's gonna be electronic monitoring, and that's why it's important to upload the information, you're gonna have the paper copies, and you're gonna have the electronic copies. Now the benefits of having electronic data storage. So the first one, paperless. Of course, there's lots of documents, so less storage space is required if you have electronic records. Some people consider this environmentally friendly as well when not using paper. And there can be convenient access for staff. You don't just have to go to the file room to look, look at a chart. You can access it from your computer on site or at an additional site. Also, it permits remote monitoring, which I'm going to discuss in the fourth section of this presentation. So here, sponsors and CROs do not have to be on site to examine charts or data, and investigators can review data charts for multiple sites. So what this does is it does create efficiency. It eliminates steps in the process that are there if you're handling documents. There are, of course, challenges to electronic data storage. One, it can be very expensive. You have the high initial expense for infrastructure and technology to manage online documents and to control and make sure that access to data is secure. There's also the confidentiality concerns. Once you start to have these records online versus in a fire room, you have more people that can possibly have access to the documents and the potential for breach in the system. And finally, there is the compliance aspect to having electronic data storage. So if you're using electronic data storage for uh, research records, you may have to comply with 21 CFR Part 11. And what 21 CFR Part 11 does is says if you're going to have these electronic records, you have to be compliant and you have to have all these various things that ensures compliance. And you can be audited on this. And I'm going to go through those real quick to give you a sense of what would it entail if you really want to have electronic data storage. So first, your system would have to have validation to ensure accuracy, reliability, and consistency. You have to have accurate generation of records for agency inspection. You have to have protection of records to always allow retrieval. You have to have controls to limit access to authorized individuals. You have to have computer-generated audit trails. You have to have operational system checks to enforce sequencing of events. You have to have checks to ensure only authorized users can access or use the system or modify records. You have to check the validity of source data. You have to have processes in place to ensure those who develop, maintain, or use the system are properly trained. You have to have written policies holding individuals accountable for inappropriate use of the system. 
and you have to have a change control process. You can't just change your electronic system on a whim because something is not right or you need to fix something. It has to go through a change control process. Everything has to be documented in terms of the changes to the electronic data storage system. So determining whether or not to implement electronic data storage really becomes a business decision. So where does the IRB review come into play? First, the applicable regulations are in the FTA and DHS regulations, and they require the IRB to ensure there are adequate provisions to protect the privacy of subjects and to maintain the confidentiality of data. So what this means is sponsors, CROs, institutions, investigators all have to make sure they provide the IRB enough information so the IRB can ensure when it's taking it, making its decision on the protocol that there are adequate provisions to protect the privacy of subjects and to maintain the confidentiality of data. But now there's a major challenge to this. The IRB is not an expert on electronic systems. The IRB is not an information technology board. It's not a computer science board. It's a board designed to protect the rights of human subjects and determine the validity of scientific studies. So what does the IRB actually have to review? Again, it's not exactly clear right now, but the IRB should have, again, enough information to know that there are some adequate provisions, that there are adequate assurances, that there are protections in place on the electronic data storage system so that the IRB can be comfortable that confidentiality of data is protected. We are hopefully going to get some more helpful information from the federal government in this area. And what I'm talking about is the new common rule. So in the July 25, 2011 Federal Register, and I think everyone is aware of this at now, at this point, but the DHHS issued an advance notice of proposed rulemaking rule communicating that in the future there may be a new common rule. This new common rule, the 45 CFR 46 regulation, which is really the, the heart and backbone of the human subject protection industry, there's going to be a lot of changes. But one of those changes that are proposed is that it notes that the IRB is not the computer expert. And so what it reaffirms is that the IRB, yes, should know that there are adequate provisions to protect the privacy of subjects and confidentiality of data, but the IRB should not be responsible for really getting into the nitty-gritty of what's, what sort of software is available, what actual technical things are in place. That's not the IRB's role. And it even says that in the advance notice. So, for example, a rationale in advance notice that says that IRBs were not designed to evaluate risks to data privacy and confidentiality. And what the new rule proposes to alleviate this problem is the new rule wants standards and data security that all clinical research sites, sponsors, and CROs would have to follow when electronically storing data. Now, what the hope is is that these uniform specific standards will help assure risks to privacy and confidentiality are addressed without requiring IRBs to conduct a specific review of such risk or a specific review of the software and the various technical details that are in place in these systems. So the key takeaway from this section, whether to implement electronic data storage is a business decision, again, based on benefits and challenges. If you do have electronic data storage or you want to use it, make sure you provide the IRB with sufficient information assuring the IRB the confidentiality of electronically stored data is protected. Again, you don't need to get into the specifics, into the actual software and things of that nature, but you do need to assure and provide enough information for the IRB to know that confidentiality of data is protected. And in the future, be aware of possible future changes and new required standards for electronic data storage as put forth if the new common rule comes into effect. Now the final section, electronic data monitoring. I'm going to start off with examples just like the other three sections. And the first one is minimal risk online survey research. So here, electronic data monitoring for an online survey study is going to seem very appropriate. First of all, there's only going to be electronic information. Um, there may not even be specific sites with your traditional investigators. So it's going to make sense to really conduct that research and I'm sorry, to monitor that research electronically. And with this example, what I want you to consider is really is the type of research that you're conducting that dictates whether or not electronic data monitoring is going to be appropriate. As another example, a phase one drug trial. Here, electronic data monitoring might not be as appropriate. You really need to have monitors there on site that know and, and can see whether or not a drug's being stored properly, 
and get a sense that the site is really conducting the research according to the protocol. Of course, every type of research could potentially have some aspect of it put electronically and therefore have electronic data monitoring. So for example, even in a phase one drug trial, you could have subject visit schedule uh, stored electronically and lab values stored electronically. And here what this may help is you have these monitors from a central location who real time can review the, this information and provide help and oversight and monitoring of various aspects of that phase one drug trial. So what can you monitor electronically? What are the specific things that can be monitored electronically? Now this list is not exhaustive, but what I say is data results obtained or entered electronically, subject visit schedule, reported protocol violations, recorded adverse events, query resolution query issue, site training records, and communications between the site and monitor. So the benefits of electronic data monitoring. You have investigative site support that is consistent, centralized, and real-time support for site. So when I'm talking about electronic data monitoring, I could, be, I could be using the words interchangeably centralized or electronic. And here, as an example, um, sites can review data with a monitor if there are questions, or the monitor can notify the site if it appears the subject is close to being out of a window on a follow-up visit. So before, you would have uh, persons who are recording data, and they may have questions about it at a site and they would have to wait till the monitor actually came in to have their question answered. But here, since the information is stored electronically, the monitor can be on the phone saying, okay, yeah, this was recorded appropriately or this was not. So you don't have to wait till actual in-person visit. There's that real-time support. Also, this allows efficiency. You may be able to eliminate some on-site visits if you have electronic monitoring. And then if there's going to be those on-site visits in addition to electronic visits, the on-site visits can really focus on things like uh, specific things like looking at chart data to make sure it seems accurate to really get a sense that the site is performing the protocol appropriately. And if you have to have less visits, in-person visits, this could be an expense reduction. There are challenges to electronic data monitoring, for sure. One is there's always the on-site effect of an in-person monitor. It's really only likely that an on-site visit can identify source data errors, assess the familiarity of the site study staff with the protocol investigational product, or assess compliance with the protocol investigational product accountability, or really provide a sense of the site's overall quality in conducting a trial. Again, a lot can be done electronically, but it's really this last bullet that you kind of miss out if you're not there in person. Another concern is duplicate monitoring. Let's say you have electronic monitoring, but also in-person monitoring. It's possible that there could be overlap in work. There's also the compliance aspect. Like I mentioned, if you have electronic data storage and then electronic data monitoring, there may be compliance requirements under 21 CFR Part 11 that require uh, IT expertise. So with definite benefits and challenges to using electronic data monitoring, how do you know when to actually use electronic monitoring? So first, I want to get this out of the way right away. Using electronic data monitoring is acceptable. And the reason why I even bring this up is because there was an old guidance called Guideline for the Monitoring of Clinical Investigations, and it was published in 1988. Now, this guideline was around for a long time and was only recently withdrawn. And what this guideline had said is the most effective way to monitor an investigative site was to maintain personal contact between the monitor and the investigator throughout the clinical investigation. So this made a lot of people very weary about conducting electronic, electronic data monitoring or centralized data monitoring because they thought they always had to have on-site monitoring visits. Well, we know that's not the case anymore because this guidance was withdrawn. So the two applicable regulations when we're talking about electronic data monitoring are 21 CFR 312.50, this is a FDA drug regulation, and also 21 CFR 812.40 a device regulation. But what both of these regulations say is that the sponsor needs to ensure there's proper monitoring of the investigation and that the investigation is conducted in accordance with the general investigational plan and protocols. So this is true also with electronic monitoring. If you're going to choose to use electronic monitoring for all or a portion of the study, you need to make sure that this monitoring is inadequate. The ICH GCP also touches on monitoring. It says essentially the same thing that the FDA does, that their sponsors should ensure adequate monitoring. 
But the ICHD speed goes a little bit further and says this monitoring should be tailored based on the objective, purpose, design, complexity, blinding size, and endpoints of the trial. So if you take the two FDA regulations, you look at the ICHGCP, and you consider the withdrawal of the old FDA guidance that talked about on-site visiting, there's really the opportunity for electronic monitoring. And Dr. Ball, with the Division of Scientific Investigations with the FDA, her statement here that I have up on the screen also lends credence to the fact that you can, and it may be very appropriate to use electronic consent. So her concern was a lot of sponsors and CROs were receiving warning letters stating that there was inadequate monitoring by the sponsor or the CRO. And the response that she got from the industry is like, okay, if there's going to be this concern with inadequate monitoring, we're just going to have more monitors go to sites. She found this was a problem and issued this statement and said, this is not what they meant. They did not intend just to have investigators thrown out there to every site to ensure there's adequate monitoring. She just wanted people to think about the monitoring plan they have in place and know that it's geared toward the risk. So this means electronic consent, sorry, electronic monitoring can be very appropriate depending on the nature of the study and the risk of the study. In addition to Dr. Ball's comment, we also have a new FDA guidance for industry. Now, this guidance is draft guidance. It's not in effect yet, but it does provide very helpful information about electronic data monitoring. And what it says is the FDA recommends monitoring plans tailored to the specific human subject protection and data integrity risks of the trial. Also, the monitoring plan should identify the various methods intended to be used and the rationale for their use. So electronic data monitoring can be used. You just have to make sure the way in which it's being used is appropriate and that it's appropriate for the type of research you're conducting or the, the segment of the research that you're conducting. This draft guidance also lays out what sponsors or CEOs should really consider when they're putting together a data monitoring plan. And this applies to electronic data monitoring. They should consider the types of data to be collected in a clinical trial, the specific activities required to collect these data, and the range of inherent potential safety and other human subject protection concerns. So when you're considering whether or not to implement electronic data monitoring, really consider these three things. And if you're using that monitoring, make sure to take this information that you've considered and provide that information to the IRB. Again, the IRB wants to make sure there is appropriate monitoring. That's also a duty of the IRB. The IRB needs to know there's going to be oversight to catch serious adverse events or, or protocol violations or protocol deviations. So the key takeaway from this section, although the new FDA guidance is draft, the withdrawal of the previous guidance and the flexibility of GCP and the comment from Dr. Ball really indicates that monitoring plans should be developed based on the risk of the study and the type of the study. This means that electronic monitoring may be very appropriate depending on the study and depending on how you use it. So move away simply from thinking that you need on-site visitors to ensure adequate monitoring. And we're going to use this electronic data monitoring also make sure that you've performed your analysis of why it's appropriate and provide this information to the IRB so the IRB consider that when it's making its decision in reviewing your protocol. So I covered the four main sections. Now I just want to wrap this up with a webinar summary. And the first way I want to do that is by providing this overarching example. So in each of the four sections I talked about today, I provided an example of how the various electronic technology may be used. So here I have a link to a, a YouTube video that everyone copy and you can paste in your browser and see what comes up. But why I find this video really intriguing is it talks about this study and the study utilizes electronic consent. It utilizes electronic technologies to help facilitate consent, uses electronic data storage and electronic data monitoring. So this really ties in all of the things we discussed today and shows that when we're using these electronic technologies, you can really use all of them when conducting research. Now the overall key takeaways from this presentation today, I really want everyone to understand the benefits and challenges of each of the electronic technologies that you consider prior to implementation, and really understand the most applicable regulations and understand what the IRB expects. And remember, the IRB is a resource. It's always there available to answer any questions you may have when trying to use these two technologies or trying to determine what requires review, or really any questions that you have about electronic technologies. 
so that concludes that part of the presentation. It looks like we do have a few minutes, so I will take some questions and answers, and I'm going to turn it over to Ari for her to read me some of the questions that are coming in. Thanks, Mitchell. We've had a lot of questions coming in during the presentation, so I will just go ahead and, and read off a few of them, and we'll take some time to answer them. So it looks like the first question uh, is, you stated that one of the benefits of using electronic technologies is this may help researchers obtain true informed consent from participants. Does this mean the trend is to use electronic technologies in addition to the consent form, and does this mean that IRBs may require these new technologies? That is a good question, and I'm glad I have the opportunity to clarify. So based on this mission's quorum review is seen, I would say yes, there is a growing trend in using electronic technologies to help in the consenting process. However, I would not yet say that the use of such technologies is common. Also, by stating that using electronic technologies may help obtain true informed consent, I'm not implying that without the use of supplemental technologies to help explain the study, that true informed consent is not being obtained. That's an important point. Currently, participants read and sign a consent form and have their questions answered by the study coordinator or investigator or both. So according to the regulations and in general, this process ensures informed consent is obtained. Therefore, as of right now, using electronic technologies such as videos or interactive websites or anything else I discussed today is not required by IRBs. Of course, what I want to emphasize is that using various electronic technologies to help supplement the consent form and informed consent discussion may help communicate to participants on a level that is beyond standard reading and listening. This may help subjects better understand the research and retain information about the research, especially those persons who do not typically learn very well simply from reading a consent form. Again, I talked about people who may be auditory or verbal or tactile learners. So the clinical research industry and the development of new drugs or devices or biologics is not stagnant and is constantly evolving, and there is no reason I see why the human subject protection aspect of clinical research cannot also experience innovation and evolve to improve itself. Okay, the next question. For the electronic data monitoring portion of your presentation, you stated that the sponsor or CRO should provide support to the IRB for its monitoring plan. What specific information should the monitoring plan include and in what detail? Okay, so to get into some specifics, maybe kind of hard to really list out all the specific criteria, I'm going to do my best here. So when I said support for the monitoring plan should be submitted to the IRB, I mean that the IRB should have enough detail about the electronic monitoring to ensure the plan seems adequate in its ability to ensure the protection of human subjects. Again, that's the IRB's priority. For example, ensure that serious adverse events or multiple protocol violations are identifiable. Therefore, the plan should include how electronic data monitoring is being used, including the portions of the research in which it will be used. So for example, also a description of the security measures in place for the electronic monitoring system, and it should also include information about how on-site visits may supplement the electronic monitoring where appropriate. So for example, a phase two drug study will likely need in-person monitoring at some point to ensure that the study is being appropriately conducted, that the drug is being stored properly, and that source data is verified. Moreover, the data monitoring plan should always include, in addition to information about the electronic data monitoring, whether there is an external data safety monitoring committee or internal data monitoring committee, and really any other relevant information to ensure the IRB that there are mechanisms in place to catch whether there are issues at the site or whether there are issues with a protocol that require a protocol amendment, or really in severe cases, um, an issue where there may be something where the IRB would have to take a severe action, like a suspension of the research. Okay, the next question is, my company is hoping to start having subjects screened online prior to the first on-site visit. The screening questions ask subjects about their medical history. At the first on-site visit, subjects would sign a consent form. How do we submit this to the IRB? Okay, thank you, Ari. This seems like a practical question, so I may have to assume a few things when answering this question, but here you would submit the protocol and protocol consent forms to the IRB for review. Additionally, at the same time, you would submit the screening questions for the protocol and the screening consent form. However, since the screening questions are answered online, I'm assuming that the subjects will not be submitting a signed copy of the screening consent form and instead will be checking a box like I discussed today or indicating somehow online that they consent. Therefore, I would say in addition to the screening questions and screening consent form, 
you would also need to submit a request for a waiver of documentation of consent. To clarify, this means subjects will still be consenting electronically to the screening, but will not be providing a signature. In this scenario, however, remember that if the subject does pass screening and comes in for his or her first visit, the subject must actually sign the protocol consent form because the waiver of documentation of consent would only apply to the online screening consent form. Okay, it looks like we have time for about one more question. If the new common rule sets out standards for data security, how will this affect IRB review of protocols and of consent forms? This is a good question and just one of the many questions that are coming from the advance notice of proposed rulemaking. So, I would say if OHARP under the DHHS issues specific standards for data security, then research under the jurisdiction of DHHS regulations would obviously need to comply with whatever those standards are. Therefore, the IRB will have a more clear-cut way of knowing that there are adequate provisions to protect the confidentiality of data. The reason for this is, if the standards are in place, this means in and of itself there are adequate provisions. Of course, IRBs are independent boards, so the IRB will still have the ability to use its independent judgment in deciding whether confidentiality in the study is sufficient. As for consent forms, if there are new required standards for data security, the IRB will still need to ensure that participants are informed of how the confidentiality of identifiable records will be maintained. That will always need to be an element in the informed consent document. Okay, I think that's about all the time we have for questions. If you had additional questions and they didn't get answered, uh, please go ahead and submit them to clientrelations at quorumreview.com. We'll do our best to follow up individually or we're planning on creating a Q&A from kind of the most commonly asked questions and putting that up on our website and you'll get a link for that as well. And then just to follow up, uh, reminding you that the webinar recording, the slide deck, and the Q&A will be posted on our website at various points in time. We will be emailing links to view these items as they become available. We, will, we really do value your opinion, so please do take the survey that's at the, end of this, uh, at the end of this webinar and provide us with feedback, and especially of additional topics that you'd like to have us do future webinars on. So in closing, once again, I want to thank you very much for attending our webinar. We hope that you found this topic informative.